thank you all for coming out on this cold, rainy night. Not rainy, windy. Um, tonight we're going to be talking about the golden age of dolls, which I consider to be dolls from the 1920s through about the mid-1960s. Um, when I was doing the research for this article, uh, I realized that dolls have been part of our culture since 67 BC. Now, don't worry, I'm not going back that far, <laughs> but uh, I thought that was really interesting. So I guess dolls have always been important to us. Once upon a time, before the internet and before cell phones, and Wi-Fi, and all of those things, even before too many TV sets, children actually had to entertain themselves. They, um, if they were lucky enough to have a neighbor next door that maybe had a little girl or a little boy their age, they could go back and forth and play. And then there were those of us who didn't have neighbors next door. I grew up in a big farmhouse out in the middle of rural Alabama. And my closest neighbors were at least three miles away, but it didn't matter because they didn't have kids anyway. So I, dolls have always been a part of my life. And um, I used to really enjoy uh, playing with them. I think that if you think back, um, on some of your first dolls that you had that you really learned a lot from playing with dolls. You learned, especially if your mom had a uh, new baby, a uh, brother or sister, and you watched her take care of the baby and you wanted to do the same thing with your doll, um, you would do that and you, would, you learned how to change diapers and how to give bottles and how to bathe the baby and all of that stuff. And so I think it was a real um, nurturing experience. I think it made little girls really appreciate their dolls. And so um, I was thinking about the first time I ever washed a garment. And it had to be a doll dress. So the same thing with ironing. Um, I bet you ironed your doll clothes too. And if you, your mother um, happened to sew, you had a basket full of, of uh, scraps that you could use to make doll clothes with. So a lot of housekeeping skills were learned by playing with our dolls. Now before 1920, we had baby dolls, but, but they were made of bisque. Their heads were bisque, which meant they were breakable, and their bodies were hard. They weren't soft and cuddly like a baby would be. But when we stopped importing those bisque dolls um, from Germany, a lady by the name of Grace Story Putnam came up with the idea of a newborn baby doll, and this doll was actually sculpted after a three-day-old baby. And it had a cloth body, which was soft. And so I think that was kind of the beginning of the cuddly type baby doll. And then in the first of the, of the 1920s, we had mama dolls. Uh, this is an example of a mama doll, a really beautiful one. The material being used for these dolls were, uh, it was composition. And composition is a mixture of sawdust and glue, which is poured into a mold that hardens, and then it's painted over with the flesh color. And they really are very lifelike. Um, I really like composition dolls. And this is a good size doll and a very nice one with a 
human hair wig and a beautiful outfit. And I, <laughs> I found out that looking at old ads that you could purchase one of these for just about $2. So that was kind of heart wrenching. But um, that, that was the start of, and the reason that they called them mama dolls was because when you bent the doll over, she had a voice box inside her cloth body that said mama. And then somebody got the bright idea that they also should say papa. So if you bent them one way, they said mama. If you bent them the other way, they said papa. So that was a real big deal when it happened. So, and then um, in the 1920s, about 1928 or so, the F&B doll company came out with a line of Patsy dolls. This is the first um, composition Patsy with the um, patent pending mark on her back. And um, as I'm talking about these, uh, F&B was very good to mark their dolls. Dolls are usually marked on the back of their head down below their hairline or on their backs between their shoulder blades. Now, that doesn't mean that every single doll is marked because they're not, and it's real frustrating when they're not. But um, anyway, that's little Patsy. Actually, that's the first Patsy I ever bought uh, years ago. And she's got her original outfit on. And the little book that you see with her um, is really adorable. It's actually a sticker book, which I didn't realize they had sticker books way back then, but it's very colorful and very cute. And these are all Patsy's. These are all Patsy Jr., which is a size down from the Patsy that we just saw. And it's interesting because even though they're all the same size, they have different characteristics. The one on the left uh, is the black Patsy Jr. And the black ones are very, very difficult to find. She has painted eyes and the little pigtails. And then the next one um, has sleep eyes and molded hair. The next one has a wig and sleep eyes. And then the one on the end down there has painted eyes. So there's four variations of the same doll there. Now, along about this time is when Drinking Wet Baby Dolls came to be. And it's very interesting, the history um, of them. We've got, this is uh, Betsy Wetsy on the left, uh, Dottie Baby in the middle, and Tiny Tears to the right. Now, Dottie Baby was the first Drinking Wet Baby made by the F&B Doll Company. And, the company was very reluctant to make this doll because the owners of the company thought it was just a disgusting idea. Why in the world would you want to make a doll that would drink and wet? But um, as they thought about it a little more and got some more input, they decided that maybe it might be a good idea. Well, the neat thing about the F&B doll is they sealed all their joints off on the inside. So that when the doll took in water, it did not remain in the body and, and rot or mildew or go rancid or anything like that, where a lot of the other dolls, uh, that, that did happen. And it's really disgusting to find one that's been played with a lot because the, the smell will really knock you over. Um, the Betsy Wetsy on the left is, a, is an early, early Betsy Wetsy, and um, she's, she's a very cute and sweet doll, and she was made by the Ideal Company. And then we've got Tiny Tears over there on the right. This is, that's a Tiny Tears with the little uh, caracal wig, which I think is just adorable. 
So it was interesting, uh, Bernard Lipford, you'll, you'll hear this name several times during the program, he's the most prolific doll designer ever, and he did most of the really nice dolls um, all during this time period. And he was a big, gruff German guy, and he wore um, a hat, a fedora all the time, and he was always smoking either a cigar or a pipe. And he sat there in his little basement, and he made these dolls, and when they asked him to do Dottie Baby, when he finished, he said, that is the dumbest looking doll I ever saw. So um, he had a little sense of humor, although they they kept the, the mold, and I really think it's adorable. But um, anyway, you'll hear more about him later on. Then the next slide is everybody's favorite Shirley Temple. This Shirley, uh, 1934, this one is um, dressed in the music note dress from the movie Our Little Girl. Now, Shirley had, she was born in 1928, and she went to dancing school. That is where she got discovered. And before 1934 was even, uh, had, had been going on very long, she had already started starring in movies, and she had done a number of movies by 1934. So she actually got a mini Oscar at the um, Academy Awards ceremony. And she, went, she was um, signed under contract with Fox Studios. And Fox Studios really, we were coming out of the Depression when all this was going on. And so Fox Studios had really um, they, they almost went bankrupt, and if it hadn't been for Shirley, they probably would have. But I found out that they were paying Shirley $150 a week. Well, another one of the movie companies came along and tried to buy out her contract at $1,000 a week. And so um, Fox decided that they had better not let Shirley get away because she had really saved the day for them. So they upped her salary to $1,500 a week. So uh, that was pretty good money for a child back in those days. Um, Shirley is, was so much more than a beautiful doll. She really um, was America's sweetheart. And she did so many good humanitarian things uh, later on in her life that um, she worked in politics. She helped found the MS Society because one of her brothers had MS. And she was even in charge of the inaugural uh, ball and the inauguration for Jimmy Carter. Now, um, she passed away in 2015, and I don't think that the world will ever forget Shirley Temple. Um, she was such a darling girl. She had 56 curls. You had to count them, 56 curls. And a cute little story, you know, you never heard of Shirley doing anything bad, but President Roosevelt really liked her. And that, so she and her mother were invited to go to the White House to have dinner uh, with he and Mrs. Roosevelt, and they were cooking hamburgers outside. So unbeknownst to Shirley's mother, she had carried her favorite toy in her little handbag. Her favorite toy was a slingshot. And she also had a marble for a weapon in there. 
And so Mrs. Roosevelt bent over to turn the hamburgers and Shirley couldn't stand it. She just hit a bullseye. And of course she got into a lot of trouble with that, with her mother over that. But it was funny because I think she was a little bit of a tomboy. She said later on, even after she um, obtained so many dolls from so many different sources that she really loved, but her favorite thing was the box of toy guns. So, okay. And this Shirley is very special. This is um, the Texas Ranger, and she was made for the 36th Centennial, uh, the Texas Centennial. Um, she was made in just three sizes. This size that you see is an 11 inch doll. All of these sizes are very, very desirable. Uh, the largest one, I think, is the 27-inch uh, cowgirl. And you can't see it, but she has a band on her hat that says, Ride em, Cowboy. So she's really all decked out with her guns and, and all of her equipment. And like I say, it's a very sought-after uh, doll. So I, I think everybody in Texas should be aware of this one. This is Shirley Temple Baby, and this is a very rare doll as well. There's an interesting story behind this doll. At exactly two days before Shirley passed away, I purchased this doll uh, at a sale, and she did not have original clothes, but she was in wonderful condition. And I happen to remember that back at home, I had a little organdy dress that was in its original box by the doll maker, the doll dressmaker, Molly. Molly Goldman made all of the Shirley dresses for the first two years, 1934 through 36. And um, so I went home and I pulled out that little box. I had been saving it for years to find the right doll to put in it. And it actually was for a Shirley, but I thought it was for, you know, the regular size Shirley. Well, I put it on and it is like it was made for her. So, and of course it was in mint condition. So, and the neat thing about, um, about the baby Shirley is that she has flirty eyes. Her eyes will go from side to side. And so that's a cute feature. Um, she has a cloth body and um, they're, they were made in s several different sizes. So she's a very desirable doll as well. And now in 1935, there was a real spectacular happening. It wouldn't be so spectacular today, but in 1935, the Down Quints were born. And they were born to a Canadian couple who already had several children. And so what happened was the, the um, government, the Canadian government, took the babies away and put them in a place called Quintland. Well, Quintland really turned out to be kind of an amusement park thing, and, and people could come, and through the glass walls, they could watch the babies do different things. And this particular set, it, these are toddlers. They're uh, seven and a half inches tall. Toddlers with little um, printed swimsuits. Now these are unusual because of the hats that they're wearing. Um, and if you notice, all the little um, sunsuits are of a different color because each each girl had her own signature color, and that's how they were always dressed, probably so they could tell them apart. But um, anyway, they were absolutely adorable little girls and um, very, very much in the news until 
uh, they got to, you know, maybe preteen age or something. But um, sadly, they didn't have a really great life. And I kind of think that was probably a lack of real nurturing because, I mean, who could grow up normal in closed in a glass <laughs> a building with people walking around looking at you, it's kind of like you're in the zoo. So, um, yeah, there, there are babies of these, and then there are some larger ones of these, and there's also furniture. And so they were very, very popular at the time. Now, an interesting thing to point out right here is Madame Alexander jumped upon the chance to get the license to do the quince because... When Shirley became popular in 1934, Mildred, uh, Madame Alexander's daughter, said, Mother, we need to make a Shirley Temple doll. And Madame Alexander said, Who's Shirley Temple? So Mildred said she realized that her mother worked so much that she didn't have time to go to the movies, and so she really didn't know who Shirley Temple was. So she missed out on the uh, making of the Shirley Temple, so she lost no time getting her name on the down quince. Oh, here's, the, here's a great picture of the tag on the back of the... Um, little purple uh, flowered sunsuit, uh, genuine down quintuplets by Madame Alexander. So very, that's a, that's a very clean and unused tag. It's like you like to find them. The next doll is Scarlett O'Hara. Now, this is interesting, too, because this doll was made in 1937. Well, as you know, the movie didn't come out until 1939. And so it's interesting that the doll looks so much like Vivian Lee. Just amazing how much she looks like Vivian Lee. So this is a tiny size of Scarlet. She's 11 inches tall, and her dress is a little unusual because you usually see Scarlet in, you know, the bright green um, dress. And so I think she is really, really a cute doll. And Madame Alexander loved literature, and so she loved to do dolls after people in literature and the arts and things like that. These are, you probably recognize them, Nancy Ann storybook dolls. Um, these were popular in the 40s and they were made by Nancy Ann Abbott. Nancy Ann was um, actually an actress for a while in Hollywood, but she was disillusioned with that life. And so she bought a bookstore, and in the bookstore she sold little dolls that she dressed. And she had um, a, an uncanny ability to um, use fabric. She was very, very talented at dressing the little dolls, and so she sold her, those as well out of her bookstore, and um, then later uh, had a factory to make the dolls, and it became a really big um, deal because these little dolls at the time, they were the perfect birthday gift because they only they cost only maybe one to two dollars and so if you were going to a birthday party for a child that was just the perfect uh, price point and so they there were all different kinds of series their family series the nursery rhyme series the months of the year the days of the week it just goes on and on but they are very um 
very popular, they become very popular collector stalls. Now, in the next slide, we have, this is Mammy and the Baby, which is really a cute, cute set. And um, I wanted to include it so that you could see the box because you'll remember, once you see it, you'll remember um, those boxes. So these have a lot of uh, followers. So there are a lot of collectors of Nancy and um, st storybook dolls today. Okay, we're getting into the war era now, and in about 1952, d different companies made um, military-type dolls. The bigger dolls, the three boys, are Skippy dolls that are made by the F and B doll company, and they um, actually Skippy was Patsy's boyfriend. So, in the Skippy is from the book um, by Percy Crosby. Anyway, we've on the left we've got the soldier, and then the sailor, and the one on the right is rather rare. He's the aviator. So um, they were really cute, uh, made up as military dolls. And then the two little ones in the front are Vogue dolls. They're Vogue uh, toddles, which came along a little before the Jenny doll. Uh, that's Miss America and Uncle Sam. And they also are from 1942. Um, Raggedy Ann and Andy, the, I have to admit that the Raggedy Ann and Andy in this shot are much younger than beloved Belindy. Uh, they're, the, the Ann and Andy are probably from the 60s, but I didn't have an older pair to show you, but the, um, beloved Belindy is from the, very late 30s or early 40s, and she is just a charming doll. And, of course, Johnny Gruel um, was the person that came up with Raggedy Ann and Andy, and he wrote the books. And when I purchased um, Beloved Belindy, I was so impressed because she was in such wonderful condition. Her, the bow uh, that ties her apron in the back has never been untied, never been disturbed. And so she's just a real treasure. And she said she didn't mind taking care of these two youngsters, at least for a little while. Now, this is the original Rag Raggedy Ann and Andy. These are from 1915 by the Voland Company, and the, the Voland Company was the one that um, published Johnny Gruel's books, and so these were the first uh, example of Raggedy Ann and Andy. They are very, very sought after today and bring a big price, um, and there was an interesting, there was an interesting story. You know how all the Raggedy Ann and Andys have a heart on their chest that says, I love you. Well, in the beginning, they had candy hearts in their chests, and that wound up not to be a real good idea because the kids discovered that they had candy in their chest, and they would suck on it, you know, and so the doll wound up just being a gummy, gooey mess. So after that, they decided that they better start putting wooden hearts in the dolls rather than candy. And then here are the Cupies, um, 1940s, most, well, the, the one, um, the second one from the left is, is an earlier one. But uh, Rose O'Neill invented the Cupies, and she was a very talented and eccentric lady. She was a writer, a uh, sculptor, 
uh, an artist, and she first did her cute little keepy drawings in magazines. You may remember them in the uh, Ladies' Home Journal. There were little stories that came out um, every month. And she did paper dolls as well before she decided to start doing dolls. Now, of course, the first dolls that Rose did were uh, made of bisque. And she made a line of little bisque, just little straight cubie dolls from two inches up to 12 inches. And somebody asked her, why are you wasting your time making those little bitty dolls and she said because I want every child to be able to afford one so um, this one the doll on the left is a 1940s um, doll from the cameo company and it it is an original outfit although it's a very unusual outfit. Usually when you find these, they're dressed in the sunsuits, like the one, like the scoodles on the far right. But um, I came across this one with the little felt outfit and I thought it was so cute. Then the next one is early. I think this, it might even be the 20s. Um, it has a harder kind of composition head, and it has a cloth body. And then it has, uh, on the front of the dress, it has the cupy tag. And then the doll on the far right is Scoodles, who is part of the cupy family. Rose called him the baby tourist because he was always running around uh, getting into trouble. And so those are three of Rose O'Neill's great dolls. Now, this doll is a doll that has lots of memories for me. Um, when I was 10, I went to Chattanooga, Tennessee on a trip and we went to a department store downtown and I think the idea was I was supposed to drop hints for what I wanted for my birthday. Well, I dropped hints all right. I found, I fell in love with this pink bride. Bride dolls were real popular then anyway. and. To have a pink bride, oh my goodness. So she was, I thought she was the most beautiful thing I ever saw. Um, so I didn't get her. <laughs> and I, I got a bride doll, but this was 1949. And this is when we were switching over from composition to hard plastic. And so I got a composition bride doll, which I'm pretty sure was on half price or something, and wound up to be a better deal than this one. But anyway, fast forward to, I think it was about 1999, somewhere like that, and I got a list from a friend of mine who was selling some dolls, and there in her glory was the pink bride. Well, she was quite a lot more expensive than she had been at the store in Chattanooga, Tennessee, but it didn't matter. I had to have her anyway. So that is the story of the Pink Bride, and I have enjoyed her ever since. So she's Madam Alexander, too. I don't know if I even mentioned that. Okay, then it's 1949. We've got the uh, movie about the little women. And so Madam Alexander created these 14-inch uh, little women with the, with the four sisters and Marmy. And I think there's been little women in the line forever. Um, so... They, again, uh, Madam was very 
taken with that story. And there, there actually were um, little men as well. The little men are rare. You rarely see them. But um, this is a lovely set of 14-inch. Okay, I don't know how popular Mary Hoyer was in this area, but she was made by Mary Hoyer um, in Pennsylvania. And she made a beautiful doll. She they were first made in uh, composition and then in hard plastic. But the interesting thing that Mary Hoyer did was she had a shop, um, a knitting shop, I believe, and she sold the dolls undressed. So then you could buy patterns from her to be able to knit or sew their clothing. And so that really appealed to a lot of people. And she also sold accessories for the outfits, you know, if they needed um, skis or ski poles or cowboy boots or a certain kind of hat, she supplied those. And so there's, um, there really are a number of Mary Hoyer collectors. Um, the baby in the cradle actually is a Jenny baby um, that she's taking care of. And then there's Tony. I think everybody recognizes Tony. Um, Tony was kind of a, an advertising doll for Tony Home Permanents. And I don't know how many of you remember Home Permanents. I sure do. Um, and you just hope when you are shopping for a, a Tony that the kid didn't give her a perm because they are just so, they are such beautiful dolls. Um, actually, they didn't have real play wave solution in their little kit. I think it was something like sugar water. But anyway, um, fresh out of their box, you know, when they've never been uh, messed with, they're just stunning and that's another doll by Bernard Lipford and she's actually been called um, the most beautiful doll ever made ideal by ideal and here we have Terry Lee and Jerry Lee now I don't think these were as popular down here in this area as they were in other areas but the interesting thing about these dolls is they have a really unusual look. And the mothers, uh, the lady that designed them, designed them after her children. Now she had, um, there's Terry and Jerry, and she had uh, baby Linda and little Terry Lee and and little Jerry Lee, and there, there was a whole family. But the really neat thing about these dolls is they had such fabulous wardrobes. They had wonderful, wonderful clothes for every occasion. Very well made, and um, so they were a lot of fun to play with. And they, you know, like I say, they have a different look and some people love them, and some people can't stand them. So, uh, but they are definitely a, a one of the important dolls of the 1950s. And then here we have Saucy Walker. You may remember Saucy, and of course, her claim to fame was she walked. And they said that you can hold her hand, and she would walk along with you. Well. That was somewhat true, but um, that was the idea anyway. But she's a really cute um, doll, and she has those flirty eyes that go from side to side. Unfortunately, she most always has an eye problem. The, those eyes, I don't know, they just didn't hold up very well, and so they'll kind of sink back in the head, and uh, rather difficult to get them 
back like they should be. But she was very popular. Um, it came in two sizes. I believe that's the largest size, and then a 16 inch that was smaller. And then here we are with the little women again. This is um, the set that you most likely saw in the very early 60s. Um, they changed their clothes from time to time, uh, their, their dresses and everything. But um, the little 8-inch ones didn't come out until the 8-inch dolls became very popular um, the first part of the 1950s, about, oh, 53 or 4. Uh, all the companies were making 8-inch dolls. And um, so this is one of Madame Alexander's sets of 8-inch. Of and so we have several coming up here. Um, the next one is Cinderella. Prince Charming was not available, so the groom had to stand in. But the um, 1955 Cinderella on the right I had this doll, and you doll club members have heard me tell this story before. I had it as a child, and I played with it. I really played with it. I mean, I washed her, her outfit, ironed that taffeta within an inch of its life, which you never, ever do, and um, eventually, she fell apart, her arms and legs fell apart. So I put her all in a plastic bag and I carried her around through several moves and by uh, the time we moved to Richardson in the early 70s, I was on a cleaning jag one day and I said, I was standing out by the metal trash can and I said, I am never going to do anything with this doll, and I dropped it in the trash. Well, I regretted that, and then um, later on, well, I'm going to back up a second. I, I had bought the initial uh, Cinderella. I had, had a Christmas part-time job at Sears and so the toy there was only one um, toy store in Gadsden and it had well it was a department store that you went up the mezzanine and the at the top of the stairs were all of these wonderful cases and I fell in love with that little Cinderella well I decided well, okay well I've got a job now I can just buy that doll and so I did, and um, I was 15. I was, I was dating. People don't play with dolls that long <laughs> anymore, but uh, it, I, I couldn't resist her. But anyway, after the fiasco of my throwing her in the trash can, I was on the Internet one day, and one came up that was wearing exactly... There's a variation in the uh, material that her dress is made of. This was made, this was just like the one I had. So I had to replace it. So she's, she's a beautiful doll and so is the groom. The groom is so cute with his, uh, with his red curly um, hair. So, okay, now these dolls are the rarest of all the Alexander dolls, and you will probably never ever see them in person, but um, in 1998, the, you know, the internet had come along and a lot of people were buying their, uh, their dolls on the internet and selling their dolls on the internet. So, Dolls Remembered was struggling a little bit in 
1998, wondering what I was going to do next to keep the doors open. So this lady called one day and she said, I have some religious dolls that I would like for you to look at. Of course, it never even dawned on me that it was the Alexander group. But sure enough, she came in and she had a big cardboard box and she started to unload them. And there they were, all of those blue boxes. And I could see the names on the end of some of them. And this is one of those, those situations where you might just fall over backwards with your feet up in the air. I, I actually had to steady myself with, on something because this is such a, such a rare thing. So we talked a little bit. I said, they are in such wonderful condition. And she said, yes, my mother wouldn't let us play with them because she said they cost too much. And come to find out, her sister also had a set of these dolls. So um, I spent quite a lot of time trying. I'm thinking, well, there's no way I can possibly buy these outright. They're going to be way too expensive. But I talked to the lady and asked her if she would be willing to possibly put them on consignment if I could um, come up with a price that we were both happy with. And she said, oh yeah, that would be fine. So I spent several days, you know, doing research and all. And um, the minute they came into the shop, I called Rick and I said, get your camera and get over here. You gotta take these, you gotta take a picture of these. We'll never see them again. <laughs> So he did, and luckily they, they're beautiful, beautiful pictures. Um, we've got, I'll try to, if I can see from this angle, we, I've got um, in the middle on the bottom is Queen Esther. Then on her left is uh, Mary. And then there's Rhoda, which was a new one on me. Then above that is Ruth, and Ruth is actually carrying her little piece of wheat in her hand. Um, the next one is Martha. Actually, the next two are Martha. There were two Marthas, um, and they, there's a variation in their outfit. The one, the one behind Martha is David, which is, oh, just the cutest. Oh, sorry, am I not? David, I think, is one of the very cutest ones with his little outfit. And then that's Timothy up above. And let's see who else have we got. Oh, we've got Joseph at the bottom with his coat of many colors. See the red um, coat with all the uh, felt pieces on it. So there are eight dolls in all, and I brought um, a little album of, of pictures that we had taken uh, of the individual ones, if you want to look at them, because um, it, it really is a rare occurrence. Let's see, we've, oh, I'm going to go on now to more eight-inch dolls. This is, this is Black Jenny. She is from 1953, and she um, is, of course, in her original uh, outfit. And uh, these are ha hard to find, very hard to find. Then Mrs. Graves, Virginia Graves, who um, created Jenny, loved to do uh, dolls in relation to the seasons and celebrations. And so she did this little Easter bunny um, that's called Fluffy. And uh, Fluffy's a very desirable doll too. And then we have Muffy's. Muffy was made by the same lady that did the Nancy Ann storybook dolls. And they also, um, came in a dotted box. They, it, the neat thing about these eight-inch dolls is 
you know, little girls really didn't care about um, which doll the outfit went to. They just realized that all the eight-inch clothing was interchangeable. They, they could wear each other's clothes, and so a lot of clothing got lost or mixed up that way if you went next door to play with your girlfriend. But, uh, yeah, Muffy's a really darling little doll. And this is Ginger, and this particular one, she's in her Mouseketeer outfit with her Mickey Mouse mask. And that's just a little toy down beside her that I thought was really cute. But um, Ginger is another doll that has no marking. So um, it's kind of hard because she looks a lot like some of the other eight inch dolls. And then here we have Betsy McCall. Right after, um, well, Betsy McCall, it really is right out of the pages of McCall's magazine. I'm sure you remember the Betsy McCall paper dolls that came out in the magazine every month. And um, this is a really good example of the 8-inch Betsy. Now, she did come in a larger size. She came in a 14-inch. Uh, well, even a larger one than that. Uh, but she was by the American Character Company. And Ideal also made uh, a Betsy McCall, which came out early, earlier than this one did. But this doll is unusual because she has no eyebrows. And she was meant to have no eyebrows. No one washed them off. But... Um, that it, I found out later on that that's a desirable trait. Who knew? So, okay, then we go on to Sissy. Now, Sissy's one of my favorite dolls. Uh, Madame Alexander uh, did Sissy in, she came out in 1955. And Sissy has an adult figure a bust line and the waistline. And so actually, for American Dolls, she was the first doll with an adult figure, not Barbie. So uh, Sissy's about 19 inches tall, and she had a stunning wardrobe. She had a war she had an outfit for every occasion and so um also her her hairstyle uh, this will show you this one this was in is in a more casual dress she has the daytime hairstyle and then this is one with the evening dress that has one of the pulled up or pulled back hairstyles and so they were very careful to do this when they sold a doll in an outfit. Now, you could also buy Sissy without a clothing. And then you could buy from her clothing line, you know, any, anything that you wanted to dress her. But Sissy wasn't, she wasn't a slouch. She, she was a, I would say she was a high society type uh, doll because uh, you, you would think of, of Sissy being, um, oh, I don't know, a sorority girl or maybe um, in the junior league when she got a little older. Anyway, she was very much on top of, of the fashion of the time. And then we have Miss Revlon. Miss Revlon has the same type of figure that Sissy had, but um, she is made of vinyl instead of hard plastic. And the Revlon dolls, interestingly enough, um, their outfits were named after a lot of the makeup colors or the lipstick colors um, that were available uh, in the Revlon line. This 
these particular ones, um, I think this is a 15 inch one in the front, which is a hard one to find. Um, and then the larger one in the back, their outfits are called Cherries in the Snow. And I don't know if you remember Cherries in the Snow, but I do, and it was, they were very vibrant. Uh, it was a very vibrant red, and it was really popular um, at the time. Okay, now Shirley comes back. Shirley, this is 1957, and um, they brought out a vinyl Shirley Temple. This is ideal again. And Shirley herself played a real big part uh, in the design of this doll. So uh, this is a really a beautiful uh, example. The only problem with the vinyl Shirley's is that their hair is much more difficult to work with than the earlier ones. I don't know, they're, they're stiff and, and just kind of hard to work with, but I think they captured the likeness really, really well. Okay, then we have Barbies. On the left, we have a blonde number one Barbie who came out in 1959. Uh, you'll notice the outline around her eyes um, and that her skin tone is very light. Um, Barbie, as you probably remember, was uh, the idea of Ruth Handler and her husband. They were taken with the build Lily, who was somewhat of a of a cartoon character um, in the German newspaper, and she thought it would be really neat if they could do a doll and then they could have a wardrobe for her because she remembered that her daughter really loved to play with paper dolls. So that was her idea, and in 1959, when it came out, at Toy Fair, it was not that popular, but it didn't take long for it to catch on. The, um, there are many more blonde dolls made than brunettes, and so the brunettes are a little harder uh, to find. Then the next one is uh, what we call a bubble cut. I'm sure a lot of you ladies remember uh, the bubble cut hairdo. And um, it, she came out in um, 61, I believe, was the first uh, bubble cut. And it, it, that particular one is a really nice uh, example. Her lips and everything are are still intact and she looks really good. So, and then the next one is called An American Girl, um, a blonde again, and this these came out in 1965. And they're, they're very desirable today, the American girls. Um, later on, they came out with one that had really high face color, and those are really desirable too. But these are kind of the the basic, um, Barbie faces that uh, that people recognize. Oh, and by the way, Barbie's getting ready to be 60. In 2019, she's going to be 60. Can you believe it? Um, here is Patty Playpal. Patty Playpal was, um, there was 30, uh, 36-inch dolls uh, made by Ideal, and they were real popular with the little girls because you could dress them in size three regular children's clothes. So she also had a brother, and there was a, Peter Playpal, the boy, and Penny Playpal, the littler one, 
And um, so this was a real craze, these, these life-size dolls. And there was also a Shirley Temple maid um, that was the same height as Patty. So um, they, everybody seems to remember uh, the Patty Play Pal size doll. Um, Ideal made them. And uh, okay, then we have Chatty Cathy. Chatty Cathy, of course, was made by Mattel. And she was a real hit. I think she was one of those dolls that the moms had to kind of line up at the toy store to get one because all the little girls wanted a Chatty Cathy. So she says several different phrases and really is a very cute doll. Uh, still remains popular with collectors, although most of them don't talk anymore. Um, they can be repaired by certain people, but um, you know they have that string that pulls out in the back of their neck, and most all those strings that you see today are like they've been pulled out and they're dragging the ground. So that is um, Mattel's Chatty Kathy. Okay, do y'all remember Thumbelina? Thumbelina um, came out in the 60s, and she was a real cuddly baby doll. Ideal made her as well. This is the large size of uh, Thumbelina, and she has her original outfit on. And her claim to fame was, if you, she has a big wooden knob on the back of her uh, back that if you turn it, she will wiggle. She wiggles like a, she reminds you of a baby waking up from a nap or something. So really cute, um, cute doll. I, re I remember them when my girls were small, they had, uh, uh, there was Chatty, Ka uh, Chatty Kathy, there was um, Thumbelina. And they came in lots of different sizes, even a little one about that big. So, um, okay, and then Tammy, some of you may remember Tammy. She's also an ideal doll. And, you know, similar to the um, idea for Barbie, she had a big wardrobe of clothing, and she had a family, and they all had a big wardrobe of clothing, and she was just a little more, um, how do I say it? She was not as well endowed as Barbie and some of the others, and I think that because of that, a lot of moms liked her better. But uh, yeah, Tammy's, Tammy's still popular today, too. So, um, and all of her family and friends. Now, I, I don't have a picture of G.I. Joe, but I feel that we need to mention G.I. Joe because he comes along about this time. And finally, a doll the guys can play with. Although he was called an action figure, which is fine, but really he's been real popular for many, many years and was a wonderful idea with all his clothing and accessories and equipment. Uh, little boys love to play G.I. Joe. Now this is Poor Pitiful Pearl, and Poor Pitiful Pearl was one of those dolls that a lot of kids wanted but a lot of moms refused to buy because I guess they thought they were too ugly. But every time I have her at a, a show or something, you know, people will come up and say, I wanted one of those so badly and my mother wouldn't buy it for me. So this is the horse, horseman version of 
uh, poor pitiful Pearl, and she's waving goodbye to you because that's our last slide. Uh, I have a little comment. The I don't watch much television at all, but do, do the ads for the toys for today emphasize the like the commercials did you saw at the beginning of the program, nurturing and parenting and taking care of. I mean, I think that's one of the neat things of those commercials when I was watching, I said, my gosh, they were really into uh, encouraging uh, good parenting skills. And the ads, the ads today don't talk about this. What do they talk about? Killing, violence, that kind of thing? There is a Mattel commercial that I don't know some of you all may have seen recently and it's kind of interesting because there's actually a longer version but there's a shorter version that you'll see sometimes and there'll be like a little girl standing at an auditorium. She walks into this auditorium at this university and she's like a professor at like a, in a science class or whatever and so and she just starts talking but very kind of plain but you know but we're going to talk about the brain and all this stuff but just in a very childlike but it's that kind of thing to kind of you know give that incentive for for girls to go ahead and do more and that type of thing to your point i'm just saying that reinforces and mattel is using that right now it's a really cute commercial Last minute questions. This is your last try for the gap. Okay, in the back. She saw that gavel fixing to hit the podium. If you have dolls that you really would like to find out more about, they're not marked, they're dolls that you got when you were growing up. What's the best way to find out what kind of a doll they were? I mean, you had a saucy walker. I didn't know that's what I had. Um, are, there any mar are there any markings that you can see on the doll? No. No? I mean, I, I've, I've got a Shirley Temple. I've got, now i found I've got the saucy walker. But, like, I've got a ballerina doll. And there's no markings. Well... Um, are, is it the same size of Barbie? No. No, bigger. 20 inch. Okay. 18, 20 inch. Um, you probably could get some information by um, looking on the internet to see if you can find anything that's similar. Uh, that's probably what I would do. Okay, thank you. I have a proposal. Why don't you send me a picture and I'll send it to her. She, she might have a, a suggestion. Um, okay, the gavel is fixing the hit. One last question. Okay, she finally. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Got to speak. I have an Emmett Kelly doll original outfit from early 1950s. It's not like any of these dolls. He's a soft doll. Uh, he's like uh, probably 20 inches tall, maybe more. Is there any value in something like that? You were asking how to find out the current desirability of the, the clown. And what I'm going to tell you will work with other people's things, too. Um, the best way to find out the current interest in a particular doll, like in this case, Emmett Kelly, is go on eBay and type in like Emmett Kelly clown doll. And then that will pull up images of Emmett Kelly and you can see what people are selling them for. And uh, unless it's an extremely rare doll, usually you will get anywhere from five to 12 uh, images come up from different people selling the doll. And you can see different levels of condition. And um, that will pretty much tell you what the current value is. Now if, um, let's say, let's say everybody, uh, most people are selling, are asking, let's say $40 for their Emmett Kelly doll. But you can see that none of those dolls are getting bids. That pretty much tells you that 
right now, there's very little interest in that doll at that price. Now, if you see that there are a lot of people bidding on those Emmett Kelly dolls at whatever price they're being asked for, then you say, oh, well, that shows there's a lot of people interested. So that technique will work pretty much with anything. Uh, for the lady who had the ballerina doll, uh, during the early 1950s, those ballerina dolls were very, very popular. Most of them were about 18 or 19 inches. Uh, most of them were made by companies that the names are no longer really well known. Um, but they were extremely popular with little girls. I had one. Uh, the, many of them were called Nina the ballerina. Okay, and more than one company called their ballerina doll Nina. Uh, I don't know why, it was just a very popular name to call a ballerina doll at the time. Okay, <laughs> because it, she, Penny, the school teacher, tells me because it rhymes. Okay, so um, if you wanted to find out like the current value of a ball, an 18, 19 inch ballerina doll from the 1950s, Again, I would go to eBay, I would type in 18 inch ballerina, okay? You're probably gonna get so many hits, then you might try it, narrowing it down to 1950s 18 inch ballerina. Uh, and again, that will give you a pretty good idea on current prices, current um, desirability and so forth. Now I will say on those uh, ballerina dolls from the 1950s, um, because they were so popular, um, Sears sold them, Montgomery Ward sold them, a lot of them sold them, that unless it's in really good condition with the outfit still crisp and uh, colorful and she has to have her original ballet shoes and her, most of them had the stockings or the ballerina type tights and usually a headdress too. Unless she has all of those, and she's pretty, uh, as I said, the, the clothing needs to be pretty crisp, then her value is not going to be real high because as I said, there were many, many of them. But anyway, that technique that I just described of going on eBay, that will work for any doll to tell you what the current is, interest is and what um, a general price is. I think one thing that people get confused about is when you're on eBay, um, you want to go into sold items. That's what you want to do because you'll see a lot of people asking high prices for stuff. That doesn't mean they get them. The other thing is too, you know, about activity. Well, a lot of people are using this e-snipe thing, so you won't see a lot of activity until the very end, and then all of a sudden, you know, because I've watched things like say Barbie things. And it's like, I think, oh, I have a good chance at getting this. No, forget it. It goes to like, you know, $200 higher than what I, I put a bid in because they do this e-snipe at the last minute. So, you know, there's some different things now that the technology keeps changing on that. And there's also a couple other places. I don't know what their fees are. I don't know if it's nominal or whatever, but I know this because they used one of my photos of something that I sold on eBay when it sold, and it's called Worth Point. And so what they'll do is sometimes you'll see that stuff come up. If you just do a general search, not even in eBay, but just on the internet, and sometimes you'll see the same thing. But all of a sudden, then the picture comes up part of the way, and then it kind of blocks it out, and then it's like you'll see Worth Point, join now. I don't know what the fees are, but so there are all different ways to find stuff now, too. So it seems to be the way anymore. Um, for those of you who aren't in the dog club, the more specific you can be about your item, I don't care if it's a toy or a dish or whatever. For example, in dolls, if you can type in vinyl versus hard plastic, that will limit your search immensely. So you don't have to go through 300 items to look for it. If it's porcelain, bisque, hard plastic, vinyl, put it in there. Uh, because and in and, and books, for example, you can have people will put in first edition it's not but uh it's best to put in the you know the printed date because it gives a clue to the buyer it helps the buyer know what you're looking at but the more specific you can be on an item you know it, it's color it's size and it's it, the materials it's made from 
you'll get a better va idea of its value and uh, you won't have to search so hard. Because I literally, you can, you can have hundreds and hundreds of hits come up with just general words. And the more specific, it'll, you'll have 10 words. Any other questions, comments, protest? Been great. Um, come see the dolls because when she takes them home, they go back to, and they're locked up in a vault and only brought out at Christmas time.